close customer experience space for uh, nearly 20 years now, although I don't look it fondly. <laughs> um, so I actually started out wanting to be an actor, and um, I, I, I went to uh, RADA, where they have a very grueling audition process. I went as a young 17-year-old, and um, I, I got through to the final audition process, and then I decided to complicate my own life. Thank you. I decided to complicate my own life and, um, and did a, a horrendous audition of a, of a very complicated Shakespeare monologue, and I didn't get in. So uh, at 17, I faced the utmost rejection that I could possibly face at that time, and I ended up in Actors Purgatory, which is a call centre. So uh, from there, I decided that actually I quite liked it, and, um, and I quite liked talking with customers and with, with people and with managers, and quite like this idea of being conduit between what a customer was saying and, um, and what, what the company wanted to do and the problems that needed to be solved in there. And then I just I moved through different businesses. I worked at uh, Red Letter Days, which is a, an experiences company. I uh, worked there for a number of years. I then uh, went and built the uh, customer service and call, call centre experience at ASOS. Um, and I've sort of been in the digital space ever since. Uh, and then I did the same thing at, at Spotify. And I now work with a bunch of retailers, including Karen Miller and Coast, Oasis and Warehouse. Um, and I run my own venture, which is called Yoho Ventures. And what I believe in is, is democratising the customer experience. So I believe that if you provide the right information at the right time in the right way to your customers and to your employees as well, then you will get the right rewards in, in return. And actually, business and service just becomes a lot easier to, to do between both parties. Um, one of the you know one of the one of the other things that I also how I also do that is by taking out the inefficient cost within a business and then reinvesting that back into the things that matter. And when I sit down and talk to the boards in these businesses, actually when we talk about the reinvestment piece, it usually is in the people, which is why uh, Dale and I have been talking about culture and employee engagement. Because actually the problems that you need to solve in your business usually are internal. They're usually nothing to do with the customer. The customer just feels the end of whatever is going on in, internally. So, um, any questions on that? So I just wanted to get this bit out of the way. So rather than giving you a soft presentation of nice touchy-feely stuff about culture, um, and then we kind of come on to the hard uh, monetary asset at the end, I thought it would be useful just to put that up right at the front. I believe that culture does have a return on investment. This is a slide um, that is from a, uh, from a business called Good Places to Work. And they work with organisations all across the globe. And what they do is they track the companies that are, that are rated as the best companies to work for. And what you can see here is that uh, these are the returns, the stock market returns that investors will get on these companies. So these are the companies that are voted, the top 100 companies voted best companies to work for. They get almost a 12% return versus companies that are just in the, in the Russell 3000 index. So that's, the, that's the top 3000 American stock companies um, in the US that are tracked through this Russell 3000 index uh, versus that which is a 6.4%. So you can see that there is a difference. There is an asset there somewhere. It's just about finding it and making it applicable and palatable for your, your guys with, 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 the, with, with, the, with the purse strings. Um, how do they measure it? They measure it through, so what they do is they take all of the businesses that sit in the Russell 3000 index, they send out surveys to all of their employees, and they then rate which are the best companies to work for. They've got an algorithm that they use. Uh, and then they come up with this rating. Um, and then what they do is they then track those businesses and what their stock market returns are versus the normal businesses. And that's how they get. That's how they get the correlation. And this is just another index. This is Standards and Poor's uh, index as well.
Yeah, I mean, they work, good places work, work with all kinds of different businesses, but for them, part of getting, you know, getting people on board with this, this mission, I suppose, is, is about proving in the boardroom that, that, it, that it does work. I just think it's a really interesting, thought-provoking graph for people to, who think that it's just a soft asset, actually. You know, these guys have found a way to try and link it back to stock market performance. They have some different um, sectors of measurement as well, because yeah. they measure uh, the leadership team, how the managers are engaging, how happy people are, the rewards. So there are different, like, separate ways of measuring how the, the development that they have. Yeah. So what what makes the good companies work? Or they they look at intrinsic and extrinsic drivers. Yeah, so it's not the Sunday Times one. No, no, it's not Sunday Times. It's 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 good place yeah. to work. So when I started thinking about what culture is, what it is to me, um, and and the companies that I've worked for, um, this is sort of what I, how I kind of think about it. And it's I don't think it's a new thing, but it's it's just worth putting out there, I guess. So for me, it's a sum of everything that goes on in the organisation when no one is looking. So we talked about the idea of measuring culture, measuring employee engagement, whatever you mentioned it. Um, and actually, it's a really, it, there's a really interesting um, tension that goes on between what we measure, so some businesses will have an employee engagement measure, or they might have taken the net promoter score and put that into, as an internal measure. Um, and that then creates a target or a, or, a, or a sort of a benchmark or a trend over time if it's an annual thing. Um, but then there's what sits underneath that. Because what we measure, we, we get the behaviour that, that we end up measuring. So we need to be careful and we need to think about what it is that we want to measure because we'll get the behaviour as a result. Let me give you an example. Um, a bank that I, I worked with uh, recently, uh, they decided that they wanted... Um, empathy to be a value in their organisation and they wanted it to be something that was measurable across their call centres. So what they did was in their, in their quality audits uh, of the calls that are listened to, they put in a, 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 an open question as the, as the measurement sign. So if the call centre advisor asked an open question, that was a sign that they were being empathetic and therefore they would get that ticking box. And so what happened was the call centre advisors organically developed this system of how to, how to make sure that they showed empathy with the tick in the box without extending their call times, because usually you know it's about average handling times. Right? So what they did was they said, how is the weather? So that became the de facto question that you asked, how is the weather? Um, until one day an old lady phoned up whose husband had died. And she said, my husband's died, I need to sort out his account, I'm trying to sort of close everything. And the agent on the other end of the line said, how's the weather? And all of a sudden, all of that measurement, all of that, oh yeah, we're doing really well, we're really empathetic as an organisation, just fell to pieces because they, were, they weren't looking at the stuff when no one is looking. They weren't, they weren't looking at the culture of stuff when no one is looking. <coughs> so how do I break this down? Well... What I've done is I've looked to a fairly unlikely source in Donald Rumsfeld as inspiration. Uh, kind of puts in my throat to say it, but you know. So what he did, he made this speech a, a couple of decades ago about, um, I think it was to do with the Iraq war actually, and it was about the, the things that we know we know. So he said, there are things we know we know. There are things we know we don't know. And there are things we don't know, we don't know. And in fact, he won a foot and mouth award for this because it was just saying, well, what the hell are you on about? But actually, if you break down what he's saying, what he's saying is that there's stuff we know, we know it happens, and we know it happens because we measure it or because we, it's articulated in some way. There are known unknowns. So there are things that we think we know. There are things that when you walk into an organisation that you feel you can't necessarily articulate, you can't necessarily measure. And there are unknown unknowns. So these are the surprises that happen 
important to all of us as, as business and as, as culture leaders. These are the things, although they take us by surprise and they're horrible some of the times for us, these are the things actually that we can fix fairly easily. These are the things that will, will, that will drive our business down. These are the things that will grow toxic and bigger over time. And these are the things that we need to actually focus on. The things that we suspect, but that we don't do anything about because we choose not to. Or because it's easier to focus on what we know, because we can measure it and we can show it in the boardroom. So think about, when you think about where your culture is today, think, and think about what you know you know, what you measure. Think about what you think you know, good and bad. And think about how can you minimise your surprises? What can you do there to minimise your surprises? <laughs> but for me, it, I always find it useful you know, going into any organisation, I have to get up to speed really quickly with what the board is saying and what everybody else is saying and see where the alignments and the gaps are. So for me, it's really useful to kind of list down, right, what do I absolutely, what do I know is going on here? And then what, what do we think we know is going on here? So the, I thought it would be useful to kind of walk you through the model that I use um, when I look at uh, culture or when I look at building employee engagement in, in my own teams. Um, and I start from, uh, from uh, intrinsic, so uh, Martin mentioned earlier about the survey and um, about the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic value, uh, value system and, and purpose and autonomy. So I start with intrinsic, uh, intrinsic drivers and the intrinsic drivers here are purpose, autonomy and, and mastery, and I'll walk you through those in a second. And then what I look at, it, uh, I overlay that with, is the assets or the resources that, that are available to me, and then what the blockers are and what the potential kind of enablers are to me, achieve using, putting my resources where I need to in order to achieve purpose, autonomy and mastery. The first thing, the absolute first thing that I have to look at is my values, because as Dale said, that is, that is how you operate, that is your moral compass as a person and as, a, as an organisation. And that's what a lot of organisations face, is the fact that they do you know, create these values and then actually that top down of, of how you bed them into your teams and into your organisation is really, really difficult because their businesses are not, they're not value, they're not structured based on their values. They're structured based on a product or a service and then values kind of then, then come in. One company that does do it really, really well is First Direct. But they started out with a blank sheet of paper and they started out as a values-driven organisation. And all their hiring, all their people development, all their processes and systems are based around the values that they have. One of the things that they also have is that they have what they feel are unique values. So for example, honesty would not be a unique value because it's kind of, why wouldn't you be, expect your employees to be honest? Playful for them is a value. So they hire people they feel are playful in, and going to be playful within their organisation. So when I think about the values that, um, that should and could exist within an organisation, to me they absolutely need to be rock solid. They shouldn't change. When I worked at Spotify, when they were just uh, building their business, Spotify changed their values four times in one year because they were not mature enough as an organisation to settle down into actually what it was that they, how they wanted to go about doing business. So instead they had a really clear purpose, they had a really clear kind of way of you know, doing things, but they felt they had to articulate their, their values a bit too early, um, before they were ready to, because they just simply weren't mature enough. So and, and they would and they would go off then and, and tackle that and they put that on their on their key results um, and then it would they would either do it or they didn't and the progress that we made the output that we had was astonishing I've never seen I mean I've managed call centres in you know quite a few in my time and I've never seen the the, the output so fast because you're delivering at much faster speeds and you're just getting out of the way and letting letting your call centre advisors solve problems as well as um, manage you know, and, and deal with customers as well. So you're ex expect 
expectation is that everybody will contribute to what the company's problems might be. Yeah. Like, so you get all the different angles and perspectives. Yeah. Yep. Wall of pain, whatever. Yep. Um, and then, and then the expectation is also that you, you know, you must deliver some personal results. But hey, choose what you want, sort of thing. Yep. So you, you're also kind of getting the motivational aspect of people. Yes. Choosing the things so that they're all, got. It all lends itself to the to the to the intrinsic part. And actually, as a call centre advisor, my mission. My overall objective might be to get promoted. So I might say, well, I want to get promoted. Uh, and if I get promoted, I'll get promoted by achieving these key results. So I'll get promoted by solving X amount of problems or by, you know, contributing, you know, taking one million off the, off the cost by solving this problem. So that's how I, that, that's how I, you know, that's how I think I will get promoted. And when you're making changes, is there a mechanism for... Because obviously if everybody goes off and starts doing all these different things, yeah. well that group's done that, how does everyone else know about that? And do you see what I mean? So when yeah. things in, so, in, interlink... So we use, we use technology to kind of to update. So everybody knows, there's, there's like a tool that we used so that everybody knows what their, what their objectives are. They, they upload them all, what everybody's key results are. And then it finds, um, finds kind of keywords and says, um, you know, says, oh, you know, Sue over here has got this key result and it kind of, could, could it be similar to yours? Do you want to maybe connect with, with Sue and, you know, and, and see if you can work on it together and then create one? So it's a very, uh, it's using technology as an enabler to getting stuff done. Uh, so is that, is that a useful tool, is that? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's available on, you know, you can look it up on Google. Uh, <laughs> a lot of companies use it now. A lot of a lot of tech companies use it um, because they, you know, they do want to deliver good quality applications or products at, at speed. But I think it's applicable to quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of organisations. And ultimately, for me, what it does is it encourages an autonomous um, attitude and an autonomous culture, which is is really key to. To, to, to the success um, of, of, of the business. So then, finally, if we go back, we look at mastery. So mastery for me is all about gaming and game theory. Um, and anybody that knows me knows that I'm actually quite a big gamer at heart, have been since I was a child. I do shoot people from my sofa and I do drive really fast cars and crash them. Um, but fortunately, I don't do any of that in real life. Um, but what fascinates me about gaming and game theory is that a gamer will spend hours solving a problem. And they know exactly the progress that they're making. They know exactly the skills that they're building, albeit in the virtual world. And when they've achieved something, actually they don't need an extrinsic reward because that reward of achieving a mission or getting over a hurdle that they've been practicing for hours or days or weeks. Think about, any of you here play any online games, any Candy Crush type stuff, yeah? Think about a level that you would complete that would take you ages to complete and that feeling of, yeah, I've done it. Yeah, I've done it, yeah, I've done it. yeah exactly. <laughs> so, so look to the gamers in your organisation. They will exist and they are great problem solvers and they are... They are your, your, your kind of, your, I suppose, your, your beacons of, of how to master skills and knowledge. And for me, the final piece of the pie is once I know I'm recruiting the right people, because I've got my values sorted, I know what my purpose is, I've got a, a framework that I can let them do, do the things that they need to do. The final thing is how do I let them see the progress that they're making? How do I let them know that they're mastering the things, the skills, the knowledge that they need to master in order to just continue getting better and better and faster and faster for me? Um, and the last thing that I would leave you with, although I haven't put anything up here, is um, a word about energy. I haven't found a way to measure energy yet. Uh, I have tried. Uh, I have done a few experiments. It doesn't involve any shock treatment, don't worry. Um, but to me, I always look for an energetic workforce. The best sign that I can see that a workforce is motivated, 
is connected, is doing the things that it needs to do, is if it's, if it's energetic. So an energetic workforce will produce more stuff at faster speeds, progress better, um, and then deliver that, that return on that investment that, that the shareholders are, are ultimately looking for. So, um, so if I get asked back here again, or if I ever see you again, and I've made progressions in my, in my energy experiments, then I will, uh, I will let you know. Um, but otherwise, I'll leave you with this. So understand your known and your unknowns. That's your starting point. Get your values so that they are rock solid. You know, that, that tension about short-term profits versus long-term gain. Oh, just pressed a quite a lot of things there, sorry. And then finally, um, have a clear purpose, autonomy, and mastery strategy um, within your organisation. Um, so that's what I've learnt. Uh, thank you for letting me share it with you. I uh, hope that you come away with at least one thing that is, uh, that is useful. Um, so thank you.